Uh, if you uh, don't have a Bible, please grab one at the back. Grab one of our devotionals. That's our gift to you this morning. Turn to page 15. We're going to get into God's Word in Matthew chapter 2. These last two Sundays, we looked at Matthew chapter 1 to see the cosmic glory and authority of Jesus. And then this morning, we're going to see that Jesus is the sustenance to our life. Right? Because I think now more than ever... We're experiencing a spiritual famine, right? There's, a, there's an inner longing of our soul that we don't know how to satisfy. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, right? So that we, we find sustenance in him. Uh, so that today our culture, really around the world, we have more access to physical food, maybe more access than we've ever had in, in human history, but what we're lacking is spiritual food. Uh, that we, have, we have cravings at the soul level, desires that we don't know how to satisfy, and we know they're there, and so we end up going to things like social media, or going on a vacation, or watching movies, or going shopping, or going out to eat, and none of those are inherently wrong or wicked, right? They're all good things, but, but at the soul level, we see that the God of Scripture exists to meet needs that are, that are beyond those areas. So that this morning, we're going to look at a passage that's familiar to our culture, Matthew chapter 2. This is a passage that you might look at, uh, you know, around Christmas, but at the heart of our passage is that people are spiritual beings who are spiritually hungry, and only Jesus can satisfy that desire. So let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I'll read you, follow along. It says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So Matthew chapter 1, we see the genealogy of Jesus. We see the promise of Jesus. So that in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus is here. He's born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a real location. You can physically visit this location today, but Bethlehem is really significant, and it's for two reasons. That first, there's promises in God's Word that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. It's Micah chapter 5. We'll touch on Micah chapter 5 in a few verses, but you need to know that's significant. There's promises that He would be born in Bethlehem. The second, Bethlehem at this point in history is the most unlikely places for the Savior to be born. Uh, historically, Bethlehem was a big deal. In the history of Israel, Bethlehem was the place where King David was born. Bethlehem, the, the word means house of bread, house of sustenance, right? It's located, it was physically, geographically located by fields of of harvest, that it was the location, the epicenter for the dynasty of Israel at the height of its power, right? It would have been a, a fortress center, but that's in the past. And so that over time, Bethlehem has been neglected. It has kind of just been run down. So that Bethlehem, at the point of Matthew chapter 2, is like that town in Texas that you drive through, right? Where you're just zooming 65, 70, and then like 45, 30. You're like, why am I slowing down? Oh, you're going through a town, and it's just neglected. You're like, who lives here? You just feel like, what? How? It used to be a buzzing population, and you're just like back to 70. And you want to, that's where the town of Bethlehem is at this point. So that the Gospel of Matthew, it's written to a Jewish audience that are in the decline as a people, right? They're living under the oppression of. Rome. They're being occupied by Rome. They're in their land, 
And somebody else is in charge. Their spiritual leaders have led them astray. And so they are spiritually starving, right? They are anemic spiritually. At the soul level, there's a longing for the God of Scripture to show up. And so that when you read verses 1 and 2, it's jarring to the first century reader, right? Because the focus of verses 1 and 2 is that the Magi from the east have come to worship. Does that make sense? Like, who are these magi? Like, the magi from the east. This is like from a foreign nation. This is from outside of Israel. This is Babylon, modern-day Iraq. And they are a people that are not Israelites. They're they're a foreign people, right, that... They would show up in Scripture like in the book of Exodus when uh, you watched the prince of Egypt and you had those sorcerers that were fighting Moses, right? I mean, that's who the Magi are, right? They're, they're spiritual advisors to a king. They're the, the intellectual elite. They're the people in the book of Daniel that were fighting against Daniel. So you read verses 1 and 2 and you're just struck like, what? Like, what are they doing here? Why are they the ones that are coming to worship the promised Savior? Does that make sense? It should be uncomfortable for us when you see that. Uh, Just so we're on the same page, that word worship, it means to bow down. right? It means to put the God of Scripture at the center of your life. It is to follow Him. It is to think to yourself that my life no longer belongs to me. My life belongs to you, Lord. What do you want me to do? So that the Magi from the East have come to worship the God of Scripture. It should be jarring for us. Look at verses 3 and 4 as it continues. Verse 3 says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he, that's King Herod, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. So that word troubled in the original language, it means filled with uncertainty. Write that in your devotional. Write that in your Bible. Filled with uncertainty. All of Jerusalem means the influential leaders of Jerusalem. Chief priests and scribes, those are the religious leaders, right? These are the people that are at the epicenter of Jerusalem, the movers and the shakers, and, and they, they hear word that the promised Savior has come, and they're troubled? Like, that's, like, what? Like, the Magi from the east, the people that are foreigners, they're here to worship, and the, the religious leaders, the, the governmental leaders of Israel are troubled? Like, some people might think these promises in the Old Testament of a coming Savior are just like only certain people know. Like, no. Like, there's over three, we don't know them today, but in Israel, there's over 300 promises in the Old Testament. Every Israelite, every person in that culture would have grown up knowing these promises, right? From a young age that one day, and we've already talked about them in chapter 1. Right, where 2 Samuel 7, where it says that one day one will come to rule on the throne of David for eternity. That's a promise. There's over 300 of them. Right? We talked about last Sunday, we talked about Genesis chapter 12, that one day one will come that will be a blessing to all the nations. That's all the ethnicities of the world. What we looked at this morning, Micah chapter 5, right? that one day like this ruler will come in the town of Bethlehem. So there's all these promises of what the Savior will look like, what he'll do, what he'll say, what will happen. And it's all coming to, ba- uh, to pass. And so you have this tension. Like these magi are the ones that have come to worship? Like how do they even know these promises? That's what you should be asking. Like how do you even hear about our promises, right, for the people in the first century? We don't really know how they knew, right? We know that they're from a foreign nation. We know that Israel... Started with Abraham, strengthened under Moses, established under David. But after David, it splits into two kingdoms so that foreign nations like Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Rome come in and deport Israel so that God's promises 
are being scattered around the world into foreign nations. And magi from the east, maybe they only had a couple of the promises. Maybe one. We don't really know. But they've traveled across the land coming to worship. Like So that when we read that this morning, there should be a part of us just like, what's, what's going on? Why are the chief priests and the scribes not filled with anticipation and joy? Look at verses 5 and 6. It says, They, that's the priests and the scribes, said to him, that's Herod, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, that's Micah, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people. So in verses 5 and 6, the priest scribes, they know these promises. They say, where? Where is he? Where is the Messiah to be born? Well, in Bethlehem. They know Micah is an Old Testament prophet. It was at a point in Israel's history where it's falling apart. And Micah speaks out, says, turn from your sin, trust in the Lord. One day a ruler is going to come. He's going to shepherd the people of Israel. He's going to be born in this little town of Bethlehem. They know this promise. So that when verse 1 starts off of Matthew chapter 2, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there should be a party Like, this is what we've been waiting for. They're living under the oppression of Rome. Like, they don't like where they are. Their spiritual leaders have led them astray. Like, they are spiritually starving for somebody to lead them to the Lord. And so finally, in their day, the promises that they've been waiting for for generation after generation, after it's here. And who's worshiping? These magi? What is going on? Look at verses 7 and 8. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may worship him. So spoiler alert. Herod doesn't want to worship uh, Jesus, right? I mean, first, Herod, the king, he's not really a king. He's the son of a, you know, a government official so that he's given a title, so that he's kind of like a puppet for the emperor of Rome. That's who's king over Rome and over Israel, so that Herod is functioning as like a puppet, basically to just keep Israel in order. Second, We don't know how much of the promises that Herod knows. We don't know if he knows all 300. He probably doesn't. But you know what? He knows enough to know that this baby is not coming to play a patty cake. That's why he's troubled. He's just like, he knows, like, this baby's not going to be fun uh, for me. Because he knows enough of those promises to know, uh, oh, he's, this one's the promised ruler? The promised king, lord of lords, like, you need to know that. We touched on this last Sunday. When we talk about Jesus, the birth of Jesus is never presented as a good guy. Our culture today talks about Jesus, like he just came to do some nice things. He's a good example of love. He's somebody to follow. He gives wise words for us to consider. No, the God of Scripture never presents Jesus that way, right? Even in the Gospels, from Jesus' words, as this little baby grows up, Matthew 8, Jesus says things like, let the dead bury the dead, follow me. Like, people are asking Jesus, like, what about my uncle? I got to go to a funeral. He says, don't worry about him. I'm more important. Like, Jesus is saying, worship me, Matthew 10. Abandon anyone or anything that comes between you and Jesus. Well, I got this really great job. Look at my car. See this house? See my 401k? See this childhood pain? Turn from all those things. Follow me, Matthew 19. Sell what you have and follow me. John 14, Jesus says, I am the way. Well, what about the, they say, no, 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 no. 
your truth. No, this, no, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Like, those are, in no way is Jesus ever presented as the magi. He's not a spiritual advisor. He's not coming to give some tips on life. Jesus knows that our souls are longing for sustenance. And he is the only one that can meet that need. That's just fact. And like, and you know this at a soul level. Like, you know this, that you've tried. We are trying to pursue other things of this world. We know we have desires. We have cravings, right, when we want to binge. You know those moments where you're like, I'm going to binge the whole season. We get so excited. Sometimes we plan for it. I'm going to let it all come out. I'm going to get it all out. I'm going to get my popcorn, get my snacks. I'm going to take the whole, turn off the phone. And it's like we're so excited and we binge the whole season. And what does it feel like when you're done? It's exhausting. We're just like, oh, my gosh. I've been sitting on the couch for eight hours. Like, I'm exhausted. What? Why? Because, like, we know our soul is, doesn't make the, the binging of a show wrong. Just, that's not, it's like Chipotle. It's just going to run right through you, right? It's just not, it's not going to last. Like, we know that. We know, how many times have you been on a vacation, we go on a vacation, we get back from the vacation, and we say to people, it was great, but I feel like I need a vacation from my vacation. Why? Because I'm exhausted. It's just like, oh, the, uh, uh, like, the things that we're going to for rest, they're good. They're just not sub- substance. Right? When you, 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 you chase after that romantic relationship. Every movie, every song, Taylor Swift right now, she's finally found Kelsey, right? It's going to last. And we just think, i got to find that one. And when you meet somebody, it's electric. When you meet that new romantic relationship for like two to three days, it's perfect. It's perfect. And then, ugh, there's conflict. We have to reconcile. We have to communicate. We have to talk about money. We have to talk about, oh, it's exhausting. Like, oh, like it was so much easier when I was by myself. When you, when you go for that career, right? Right now, it's so tempta- tem- 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 temptation, tempting, whatever. You know, to, like I'm going to find this career, the dream job. And then sometimes, by God's grace, we land it. And then what happens? I'm kind of bored. It's kind of bored. Like I thought it was, I'm looking for something else. It never lasts. Like, shouldn't that tell us something? Like our soul, we are created for something more. It's like the dashboard of our lives, and it's like maintenance required, like blinking. Like, do something with that. Like, and I got to tell you from a personal level, like, I didn't, I didn't grow up around Jesus. I came to faith in Jesus when I was 18 years old. A friend shared the gospel with me, and I believed I, I, I confess that Jesus is Lord. I profess with my mouth that I believe he resurrected from the dead. And I can tell you, I've been walking with Jesus for 30 years. I've never once found him boring. I've been working in vocational ministry, like as a pastor, for 20 years. So that means I, every day I get to read about God, think about God, talk about God. Never boring. That doesn't mean my life's perfect and, like, he doesn't answer my prayers or I don't get frustrated with him or I don't have dry seasons. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying Jesus is captivating. Like, he's captivating. I've never found anything close in this life. And I know. I went 18 years. I went 18 years with no Jesus. I know what it's like to be spiritually dead. I know what it's like to be in a desert for my soul to be longing I know what it's like to be in darkness. Like, you know those moments where you're, like, trying to navigate a room in the dark? Like, maybe you try to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and you're just hoping you don't step on something, right, or that a monster doesn't grab you. And then somebody turns on the lights, and it's like, oh, I can see. Like, I can go to the restroom now. (laughs) Like, that's what it's like when you believe in Jesus. Like, the lights are turned on. Like, and you understand life. Like, you understand present, past, pain, future, dreams, 
math, art, history, psych- like, uh, it's like all the, the, the dust of my soul settled because I was feasting on the sustenance, on what I was created for. And so I, look, I don't know where we are in our spiritual journey. Like if you've never trusted in Jesus, you need to know that he's the only one that can bring that satisfaction that our souls are craving. But I also think it's possible that there could be some of us here this morning who would say in sincerity of heart, Michael, I've professed faith in Jesus. I, I've, I've, I've grown up around Jesus. I've been walking with Jesus. But like, I don't have that same hope that you're describing. Right? I think that's possible. I think it's possible that you could say, like, I know Jesus, and, and yet I haven't found that, that, that satisfaction at the soul level. Like, what does that mean? Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, after hearing the king, they went their way, that's the Magi, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they, the Magi, saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. All right. I think sometimes people get very excited about the star. Like, what does the star mean? I've seen people, like, break out astrology and astronomy, and they're just like, well, technically, I'm the, you know. I don't, I don't know. Maybe the star is a comet. Maybe the star or the... Angels appearing to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. I don't know. I don't think the star is the focus of the passage. I think the focus is the magi. The magi from the east are showing up rejoicing exceedingly with great joy. Right? That's the contrast. That word exceedingly in the original language means great. So that the word... Verse 10 reads, rejoiced greatly with great joy. It's a lot of joy, right? That their souls are, are feasting for the first time. Like, this is what I've been looking for. Remember, they're from a foreign nation. They just know just bits and pieces. And yet they've come to worship and they're like, yes, right? So this morning, you've got to read that. This familiar passage that we study around Christmas and ask ourselves, like, why do, we, why do we have this tension where you have this one group of people, these magi from the east that know just sprinklings, have come with worship of great joy, and the people that have been saturated by these promises, these chief priests and scribes and influential people of Jerusalem and even Herod, like they, they know these promises. They're in Jerusalem. They're of Israel. They're, they grow up around it, and yet they're indifferent. They're troubled. Like what? What's going on? Like why, why is that? What happened? I mean, first... I think we can look at those two groups and we can be incredibly encouraged. Right? That the God of Scripture, no matter what, will call people to himself. The Magi from the East. It doesn't matter where you are geographically. It doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter your family background. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your age or your education or your economics. The God of Scripture is alive. And he's calling people to himself. The magi from the east show up to worship. Praise God. Right? You, that speaks to the cravings of our soul. That they would navigate the land to come and meet that desire. I'm hearing that now from people in our city, from some of you in this very room, who are saying things like this. You're saying things to me like, I don't know why I'm here. I just felt like I needed to come. I don't know what this is all about. I just wanted to come and learn more. I'm not sure who this God thing, I don't know, but I just wanted to be here. Praise God. Like Magi from the East, the God of Scripture is alive, and he's calling people to himself. Praise God. We can be incredibly encouraged by that, that there is a craving at the soul level. Second, on the other side of that coin We need to see, like the chief priests and the scribes, we can be around religious activity 
maybe even our whole lives, and still not worship. Does that make sense? Like you could come, come to a worship service every Sunday since you were a little kid. Sing the songs fervently. Read the Bible. Pray. Serve the community. We can do all those things just like the chief priests and the scribes and still not come to a place of worship. Like that's, that's something we need to... We need to lean in on that this morning for every one of us. And think about that. Like, how is that? Like, right now as a church family, we have this challenge we're going to be in for the next 12 months, embolden. We're challenging our church family to in- increase in boldness and courage. And so uh, we want to be embedded in Scripture. All right? We want to be memorizing Scripture. Uh, you can QR code, make the commitment. We, we went from four last Sunday who've responded. Now we're at 15. We're growing. We're moving in the right direction, right? Joshua 24, today you start memorizing. You want to memorize that for October. We want to increase in prayer. We want to lock arms with other people. Those are all good things. But we could do all those things and still not come to a place of worship. And so the Magi from the East, they bring their gifts. It's a symbol as their life. And so that's the question for us is, is the God of Scripture has you this, here this morning to worship Him. It's not just to go to a worship service. It is to worship Him. And so to think to ourselves, like, man, what, what's stopping me from, from putting Jesus at the center of my life? That my life is not my own. That it belongs to him. That it's not my money, it's his money for his glory. So how does he want me to spend it? It's not my time, it's his time for his glory. And so how does he want me to use that time? It's not my career, it's a job that he provided for his glory. Right? It's not even my pain in my past that he's allowed those events to take place for my good. And for his glory. And so I'm not wallowing in self-pity. But I'm trusting that he's bigger than my circumstances. It's not the fear of my future. It's his future. It's his plans that he has for me. And so we're putting him at the center of our lives. That's what it means to worship. It, It isn't a worship service. It's to worship him. That's the invitation for us, church family. Listen, if, you, if you're here this morning, I'm glad you're here, but we're not really interested in just doing religious duties, religious habits, jumping through hoops. We are interested in being men, women, and children who are stumbling forward, <laughs> learning how to put Jesus at the center of our lives and to follow him. That's the invitation for us, church family. Let's close out with verses 11 and 12. It says, after coming into the house, this is the Magi, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. I mean, can you imagine what that must have been like for them? I mean, one pastor said it this way, that at this point, when these magi show up, uh, they've not heard Jesus' teachings at all. They've not, the magi didn't know any of his miracles. At this point, this is just a toddler sitting on the lap of a seemingly insignificant woman And they worshiped him. And so that's the invitation for us, church family. I'm glad we have a worship service for people to come and visit. I wish I could tell you, if you come every Sunday, I'm so talented. Our musicians are so good. It'll carry you. Like, you won't carry. Your soul will be full all week long. Just come on Sundays. I got you. 
<laughs> no. No, it's to the worship service, the Bible study, the, the prayers, the serving the community, the giving. Those are all just tools of invitation. Right? Like, you know when you go to a restaurant? You go visit a restaurant, like you're going to sit at a table, there'll be a chair, there's going to be a plate, there's going to be some lights, maybe some music, some utensils. Uh, but if nobody brings a meal, like, it's going to be a confusing experience. Right? You're not going to go back to that restaurant. Like, you're like, I didn't come for the tablecloth. You came for the meal. Jesus is the meal. Worshiping Jesus is the mill. Putting him at the center of our lives is the mill. All right, so with that in mind, I want to invite our worship team to the stage. Let's lower the lights. And I want to invite every one of us here. You're not responding to me. It doesn't matter if you, if you like me or you don't like me. It has nothing to do with me. You're responding to the God of creation. He's made you with certain cravings. He's inviting you to worship him. Maybe that means for some of us to believe in him, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Do that now. We'll have people in the back to pray with you, to pray for you. You can come talk to me. Believe in Jesus. And then for the rest of us, it's to put Jesus at the center. And that might look different for every one of us here. But I know when I look back on my life in the last 30 years, there were absolutely key moments where the God of Scripture brought me to a place. Are you going to follow me? I remember early into my walk with Jesus, a couple of years, I was, I was living in both worlds. I would go to a worship service in the morning, and then I would, I would go to the clubs on Sunday night in downtown Dallas. And I would do that week in and week out, month in and month out. And then one point, the God of Scripture just brought my soul to a place. Says, how long? How long are you going to try to do both? Like, stop trying to live in both worlds. Stop trying to chase both things follow me, put me first. It happened again in my 20s. In my 20s. Like pornography was a habitual pattern of my life, multiple times a day, multiple times a week, and just trapped in pornography. And it's like the God of Scripture brought me to a place that how many times are you going to keep making excuses? How many times are you going to keep justifying? How many times are you going to keep fighting death with death? You fight death with life. Put me at the center. Follow me. Walk with me. Know me. In my 30s, in my 30s, I had this just pattern of just bitterness and anger towards my parents and towards what the God of Scripture hadn't done in my life. And he brought me to a place. Michael, how long? How long are you going to hang on to pain? How long are you going to wallow in bitterness? Do you not think I'm bigger than your circumstances? I'm so good to you that even if your whole life was pain, I'm still worthy to worship. Worship me. He brought me to that place. Even now in my 40s, he's still doing that. Areas of character. Why are you doing that, Michael? Why are you thinking that? Why are you listening to that? Turn from those things. Follow me. That's the invitation for every one of us here this morning. So close your eyes, bow your head, pause your hearts. Listen to him. He's speaking to you right now. There's areas in your life, in your thinking, in your behavior, in your words. They're hindering you. Turn. Come to the table and feast Allow your soul to drink so that you'll never thirst again. That's Jesus. Father in heaven, we trust you for that. God, I have no doubts. People will forget what I say by the time they get to lunch, but when we hear from you, that will stick with us for eternity. 
Father, help us to respond. Holy Spirit, help us to respond. Help us to obey. Help us to make decisions right now to put Jesus first. Everything else will come into place. Seek first his kingdom. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.